We've got some filtered sunshine here at Foley Field on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Top 10 matchup and a rubber game between the Vanderbilt Commodores and the Georgia Bulldogs. Georgia right now atop the mountain, but Vanderbilt breathing down the neck of the Bulldogs. Should Vanderbilt win today, we'd have a five-way tie atop the Southeastern Conference. And with that, we say hello and welcome. Mike Morgan, he is the All-American from Ole Miss and the big leaguer, David DeLucci. And David, this is everything you could want out of a Sunday game, a rubber game, two top ten teams, plenty on the line. Oh, plenty on the line. And, and this is a Vanderbilt team, unlike teams in the past, that were great with pitching. They're middle of the pack in pitching. They've been doing it with offense. They've scored over eight runs every game this year, and it's bolstered by J.J. Blade and Austin Martin at the top. With Vanderbilt comes high expectations. Same thing this year, preseason rank number two in the country. We're also used to Vanderbilt being chock full of All-Americans. How about Austin Martin and J.J. Blade, two potential first-rounders? Kumar Rocker was supposed to be in pro ball, making millions. He chose college, and boy, is Vanderbilt happy that he did. We'll see him today, and of course, a balanced and deep roster led by five seniors. So plenty to like with Vanderbilt. Plenty to like with this Georgia squad already exceeding expectations. They've got a chance at a magical year in Athens. Yeah, they do, and they've done it with a lot of injuries they've dealt with, but it's been their starting rotation, their defense has really stood out. And really, the top of the order. It's it's their Friday night guy, Emerson Hancock. That's a surefire first rounder in the future. Two-way star, Aaron Schunk, who's been outstanding, not only offensively, but as a closer role in Auburn, or Georgia opens the SEC with a sweep. Most of their conference games have been on the road. They've played at a high level of defense, but when they get home, they're extremely difficult to beat. Now this Vanderbilt lineup is going to go against maybe the best Sunday starter in the SEC, certainly stuff-wise, Tony Losey. Tony Losey has been described as the ultimate competitor. This guy has a tremendous fastball. You'll see him top out at 97. He doesn't let up. He can keep that all game long. He's got two solid breaking pitches to go behind it. And it's a very deep and long Vanderbilt lineup led by Austin Martin and J.J. Blade. J.J. Blade has just been outstanding. Austin Martin is speed in the top of that lineup, but the power comes from Blade. He's homered in four consecutive games already this year. Losey is going to navigate uh, through a lineup of six lefties and fires the first pitch out of the zone. We are underway. Georgia in red, Vandy in black. Rubber game of this three-game series here in Athens. That hot, fiery ball above, that's the sun making a cameo here in the southeast after it's been overcast through most of the southeastern part of the country for this weekend. A lot of weather issues around the SEC, but none so far in this series. Davis, a sophomore, the first Canadian-born baseball player to attend Vandy. It's been an influx of players from our neighbors to the north playing the sport of baseball. And now Vandy's got themselves a good one in Cooper Davis. One for eight this weekend. Losey rares back and fires one at 95. And as you heard David DeLucci mention, it's not just a guy that hits 95 in the first inning. That velocity will hold for most of the afternoon while he's out there. Yeah, and, and although that is good, SEC hitters can catch up to that. It's the breaking stuff behind it that makes that fastball even more effective. Tim Corbin was telling us he mixes his pitches really well, and that's what makes it so hard to get to a guy like Losey. He starts off a leadoff walk. That has been the Achilles heel for Losey. Plenty of strikeouts, but too many walks. And a leadoff walk here to a Vanderbilt offense that is second in the SEC, averaging over eight runs a game. And now Austin Martin digs in. You see some of those rankings overall impressive. Batting average second, slugging second, on-base percentage first. They know how to work deep into accounts, 413 OBP. Here's Martin, the talented sophomore out of Jacksonville, Florida. And unlike so many Vanderbilt recruits that are just blue chip, projected first round guy this was kind of a diamond in the rough yeah it was it, it was and it's a young man where you sit there and you ask uh, is is Vanderbilt aiding his development or is he aiding this program because he's 
plays with a chip on his shoulder. He's got an edge about him. It's not your typical Vandy ball player that you see out there, and I think that has worn off on this team because – They'll get after you. If, if it comes down to it, I think the aggressiveness and the, and the edge has spread throughout the rest of that lineup. High cheese makes it 0-2. Comes back with a fastball inside, and down goes Martin. Georgia defensively this has got a chance to be one of the best defensive teams in a while here in Athens. Shepard and Talley are nearly flawless up the middle. They've had to work around some injuries both in the outfield and at first base and behind home plate. They hope to have Mason Meadows back behind the dish here soon. There's even a small chance we could see him in a pinch hitting role today. One on, one gone for the All-American J.J. Blade, the junior out of Panama City Beach. Some guys you just love to watch hit. The swing is so pretty, although David, you and I were talking with the Georgia coaches today. It's a little bit unorthodox. Yeah, it, it sure is. It, and you know what's beautiful about that? I, I love this because, you know, in today's game, we try to put all the hitters in, a, in one bubble and force them to all hit one way. And, and that's just not the case. As long as you get the barrel to the ball and your timing is right, you're going to drive the ball. This guy right here, you probably wouldn't teach some of the things he does, but it's extremely effective. It will be effective enough to take him to the next level. What is it about the hands and the way he loads that is so unique? One of the things that you see, typically a lot of guys when they load, their hands go up or they stay at the same plane. J.J. Bleday's hands go down. And when his hands go down, you also will see his head drops. And as a hitter, you don't want any movement from your eyes and your head because as you drop, so does the angle of the ball. And if you move forward any little bit in your body, you add velocity to the pitch coming to you. If you notice, J.J. Bade has such great hand-eye coordination, he will drop his head and he will drop his hands. And then from there, the massive forearms take over. So it's not necessarily a swing. It's a flip of the wrist where he gets his power from. Mentioned Losi can be wild at times. That a wild pitch and advancing to second is Davis. So Bladé's not going to make the Tom Amansky instructional video anytime soon. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it, it, I'm telling you, I, I love to see players that, that just, you, you know, when you hear all the gurus are telling you this is how it's done, I love to watch players like J.J. Bladé and say, Man, this guy's had tremendous success this year. He's tied for the lead in home runs, and he's not doing it the way you teach it, but it's awfully effective. Fred McGriff with the oversized hat not going to be praising the swing necessarily of Lede. <laughs> as, as you but mentioned, it made tied. for great info commercials. Oh, no, did it I ever. Mean. Oh, always good to see that at 2.30 in the morning. Lede tied with those 12 home runs, tied with Jacob Olson for the SEC lead. Good hitters count here, three and one. Could be gas to power with this pitch, which we'll have to wait a few more moments to see as time is called. And you know, I'm talking about Blade, and, and it's really what, what's made him stand apart from the rest of the pack offensively this year is his ability to drive the ball to all parts of the fields. We've seen him drive fastballs and sliders down and in over the right field line for home runs, but he can also go the other way. So if you're a pitcher like Losey and you've got tremendous velocity, you want to try to challenge this guy with a fastball because that's your go-to pitch right here, but you don't know exactly where to pitch him because if you go over that outside corner and he's sitting on it and he's correct, he'll hurt you out of the ballpark. Tried off speed that time on 3 1. It misses inside. So the second walk issued by Losi here in the first. Vanderbilt Commodores, engineered by that man, Tim Corbin, now in his 17th season in Nashville. Vanderbilt baseball, longtime cellar dwellers in the East before that man took over. Longtime assistant coach at Clemson under Jack Leggett, who he still talks to on a regular basis. Those guys, along with Kevin O'Sullivan, had a special staff for the Tigers for many years. He has turned Vanderbilt into a juggernaut during his tenure, including a national championship back in 2014. Super Regional seven out of the last nine years for Vanderbilt under Tim Corbin. As we look at Steven Scott, one of six lefties in the lineup 
opposing Tony Losey, the hard throwing right hander, and Losey having trouble finding the strike zone early. Stephen Scott is has the power hitting behind Blade to to protect him. Now, with the base open, it's more than likely why Losey Losey allowed that off speed pitch to be down out of the zone to take Blade and send him to first base. But with this guy up, you've got to be extremely careful. This is not a pushover. He's got tremendous power. This is the concern for Losey. 22 walks in 38 and a third innings pitch. Now he'll strike out a bunch of guys, 11 and a half per nine innings. That's one of the top marks in the country. He's only allowed more than a couple runs in a given start once this year. He's allowed three earned runs or fewer in all seven starts. But at times has been wild. Six straight balls from the right hander. Two on, one out, and the 2-0 pitch, when in doubt, go back to the fire. That one mid-90s and right by the swinging bat of Steven Scott, the senior. Yep. If you're, not, if you're not feeling that you have the control that you want, go back to what you're most comfortable with. And 95 miles an hour, it's still difficult to hit. has been mired in an awful slump of late. 0 for 14 with four strikeouts over the past three games. So he's still in search of his first hit this weekend. Big spot early. And a 2-2 from Losey. Another full count. Just having a little difficulty locating that fastball. Understand trying to throw that ball down and away. But if you get too far off the plate, you get anywhere outside of eight inches, the hitter's not even going to offer it. So, yes, you have to get your bat ready. It's 95, 96 miles an hour. You have to be on time. But you got to make sure it's over the plate. Slap foul out of play. Tony Losey, whose father was actually a teammate of South Carolina coach Mark Kingston in the Cubs organization. Tony Sr., who was a star pitcher back in the day and had a nice pro career. Very familiar with the head coach of South Carolina. It's a small world. He's out of Columbus, Georgia. His father now is a detective in Columbus. Inside corner, a paint job for strike three. When you run at 97 mile an hour fastball, if you can get that hitter looking away, and I'm not so sure that was the location that, that Marshall actually wanted, but it was extremely effective. If you get that, that hitter looking away for 97 and you bust him in, it's almost impossible for him to start his hands up quick enough to touch that ball. A Nuke Lelouch type start to this game. Two walks, two strikeouts <laughs> for the flamethrower, Tony Losey. 21 total pitches thus far as Philip Clark enters the box. A sophomore out of Franklin, Tennessee, 0 for 7 this weekend. Starting catcher. Sox one to center. Maxwell on his horse, turning tail, now slowing up and makes the catch on the lip of the track. A noisy out number three. Losey works around two walks. Patience, a virtue for that man and the Georgia administration after four bumpy seasons. Georgia last year, a national seed and well on their way to another successful season in the sixth campaign for Scott Strickland. Solid batting order. Remember, they had to replace Curry and McGovern, but they have found a way. Aaron Schunk has been good, and John Cable has been a great find as a grad transfer. He has provided some power this year for the Georgia Bulldogs. L.J. Talley also having a career year hitting cleanup today. And they'll be going up against one of the hardest throwers in the SEC. Just a freshman, Kumar Rocker, a guy who has struggled at times, 
the son, of course, of Tracy Rocker, the former Outland Trophy winner for the Auburn Tigers. Pops is the D-line coach at Tennessee, but Mom wanted the best education that Kumar could get. They believe they found that at Vanderbilt, and boy, the Commodores happy to have this young man. For sure, and, and if you notice down there, hometown of Athens, Georgia, you know that heart rate is up for a game coming back to your hometown to, to pitch, and, and he's done well. He's got uh, outstanding fastball, a very, very bright future for you, this young man. Similar to Losey in the first inning, it's got to be the command. He's got to find his command. If you get to your opposing batter to sit on fastball, they're going to get you sooner or later. Shepard pops up on the first pitch. Ray puts it away. North Oconee High School, not far from Foley Field here in Athens. Kumar Rocker starred there in both sports. Baseball, of course, all four years, just 12 miles away. And, yes, he did play D-line for two years, just like the old man, before Mom finally put a stop to that. Aletha said, no, son, I don't like the contact in football. Let's focus on baseball. And when you've got the kind of stuff that Kumar Rocker has, that's really not that difficult a decision. Not at all. I, I looked at that put, football pitcher. I played high school football, and I was typically on the bottom of those piles. And when you have a guy <laughs> like Kumar Rocker coming on top of you after the end of the play, it doesn't feel really good at all. This is a large young man with an extremely athletic body. He can field his position well. And you're going to see as he matures and gets older, it's just going to be even more special. It's an intimidating factor to look from the batter's box to see him on the mound coming right at you. Is there six foot four inch tree trunks on the bottom part of the frame of Kumar Rocker? You and I stood next to him last week in a series in Nashville. I don't know if TV does it justice to put in perspective just how big he is. You stand in the batter's box against Kumar Rocker, and it's the least bit intimidating. And that is the task for Riley King here, the sophomore out of Gwinnett County, Georgia. King skies one to center. Davis under it. And will make the grab for the second out. We're used to Vanderbilt playing exceptional defense statistically third and D1 at 983, but they believe, Tim Corbin specifically believes, they can still improve in a few areas. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the question marks from the noise is is what's up the middle. Philip Clark, Ethan Paul, Harrison Ray, it's it's those guys because, look, let's face it, Ethan Paul is filling big shoes from Connor Kaiser last year, was fabulous defensive shortstop. Both those guys are capable up the middle. They got to play a little cleaner defense than they have been. This is a perfect bunt by Shunk. Not exactly a speedster, but the bunt was so good that he'll get an infield hit out of it. Aaron Shunk, also the closer, so he knows not only from a batter's perspective what the defense is doing, he sees Austin Martin way behind the bag, and he lays down a perfectly placed bunt. Not only was the angle perfect, but he deadened it nicely, and he's able to leg it out for a single. Now LJ Talley cleaning up for the Bulldogs today. The junior out of Folkestone, Georgia, having by far and away his best season, hitting 368. Hit just 230 as a freshman. The numbers have gone up every year. 11th in the SEC with that 368 clip. You know, the thing about Aaron Schunk, third baseman, laying down a beautifully placed bunt to Austin Martin, who can fly playing third base is. When you go back on defense and Austin Martin comes to play, <laughs> you better be ready for a potential bunt because he's going to try to show you up. That's well, good for the goose. Shunk takes his lead at first. Tally dribbles one foul. LJ Tally, one of two seniors in the lineup, but the lone senior who's been with this program from the start. You think about. They lost Curry and McGovern, who were kind of their run producers for three, four years. This is the kind of guy you really felt good for last year and this year as well because Georgia had hit some really hard times as a program. And a lot of these upperclassmen, they knew nothing but losing. 
finally, as I mentioned before, patience is a virtue. It, it paid off for Georgia. They didn't take shortcuts. They didn't load up with a bunch of JUCO guys. Coach Scott Strickland told the administration, told his AD, Greg McGarity, look, we're going to take our lumps early on. And some of these players, like an LJ Talley, took plenty of lumps. Now they get a chance to experience winning and have a chance to win a Southeastern Conference championship. Again, Georgia at 8-3 right now at the top of the mountain. One on, two outs, and the payoff from Rocker. Popped him up behind second. It's going to be Paul calling for it. Looking through that filtered sunshine sky, makes the catch, and the side is retired. No score through one. College baseball is brought to you by Zaxby's. Chicken fingers, buffalo wings, salads. Find a location at zaxby's.com. Beautiful campus here at the University of Georgia in Athens on what has turned out to be a very nice Sunday afternoon. Mike Morgan, David DeLucci with you. Scoreless game top of the second, an elite pitching matchup for a Sunday. Boy, have things changed in the SEC with the depth of starters now. You've got Rocker, who is rated by many as the number one high school pitcher in America, and this guy, Tony Losey, who's got the potential to be a very high draft pick. A guy that Stays very often in the mid to upper 90s. Starts off with a breaking ball to Harrison Ray for a strike. Ray, the junior out of Longwood, Florida. First home run of the year for Ray came on Saturday. Young man who was an AAU star with my favorite AAU team name, maybe of all time, Chet Lemon Juice. Love it. I love it. You think that team had some swag? <laughs> What, what uniform would you wear for the team named Chet Lemon Juice? How Bright about? colors, <laughs> flashy. And you walk off the bus and you make a statement with a name like that. And we, we talked about that. Do you think any one of those players on that team knows who Chet Lemon is? Probably had to Google it. We'll pop up behind first. Rogers will give way to Tally. Nice job by the veteran second baseman. AAU baseball, for those that haven't heard, much like it's become a mainstay in basketball. In baseball now, David, these guys play year-round, and AAU is a big part of that. Yeah, you know, we're, we're, at a, we're in an era right now where at a very young age, a lot of our youth has got to specialize in a sport. I don't care for it very much. And, and look, if, if you look on the field today, a lot of these guys were, were – two-star athletes in high school and um, whether it's basketball or, or baseball these guys play these summer travel teams and uh, they pick some pretty cool names but it's it's an awfully long season for them um, that carries them all over the country at times did you play some summer ball in your day i played uh your typical american legion babe ruth schedule and then an all-star team after um, that traveled with, you know, when, when you won city and state and then you went to a little World Series or whatever. But there was no such thing as travel ball. So we went from a baseball season to a football season to a basketball season back to a baseball season. So I feel like there's no better way to prepare you as an athlete than to play all those sports. In today's era, a lot of these young, young boys and girls have to pick that one sport and it's baseball year-round or basketball year-round. And I promise you, when you look at the field like we have today with the top prospects in the country, these guys played different sports in high school, in elementary school. And on the hands to Ethan Paul, the senior has been around for a while out of Bellevue, Washington. I, I hear a lot of complaints from college coaches about that, that they believe these guys are maybe worked a little bit too much in the off season. And when you want to pinpoint why you have so many arm issues, in college it's not because they're overworked in college it, it, it starts when they're about 12 years old that's right you, you're you have to when you take care of a pitching staff and we so see so many guys that go to college and, and have to have tommy john surgery this one socked to center maxwell puts it away for the second out 
Well, we knew that uh, we were not going to see Patrick Raby hitting in the eight hole. This is something very accustomed to a Tim Corbin team. So Raby's spot in the lineup, that lasted about as long as my karaoke career. <laughs> it's going to be Ty Duvall, the junior. Another lefty. So again, Losey's going up against six left-handed batters. Ty Duvall, the junior out of Lebanon, Ohio. You'll notice Vanderbilt has guys from all over the country. They are well represented. It's a program that recruits nationally. We got guys from the left coast, Canada, and everywhere in between. Duvall was Ohio's top prospect back in 2016. He was a third team All-American and wound up choosing Vanderbilt. Base is clean, two gone in a scoreless game here in the second. Again, first place on the line in the SEC. Georgia at eight and three, Vandy at seven and four. And several teams already in the clubhouse who have finished their series. A Vandy win would force a five-way tie in first. I don't know if I've seen that this late in an SEC season where you could have five teams all tied at the top. And that would include Arkansas, LSU, and Ole Miss. Slow roller to Shepard. He's automatic at shortstop. And that's a 1-2-3 inning for Losi. We're scoreless in Athens. Mike Morgan with David DeLucci. It's a scoreless game, bottom of the second. Georgia offense this season. Again, these aren't eye-popping numbers, but what they have gotten a lot of this year is timely hitting. They've been good in the clutch. They don't have many holes in the lineup. Middle of the pack in so many of those categories. Again, they had a lot to replace, and what you don't see on that stat sheet, they can still go yard. They're third in the league in home runs. They've already hit a couple of clutch homers in this series, they've got a half a dozen grand slams already. Yeah, their, their homers come with runners on base, and that's the most important thing. This is a guy who had a big one earlier this season against LSU with a granny. He pops one up, and it's the left fielder. And unable to hold it in the glove. Scott has it spill out. I was wondering if it was in there long enough to still get the out call. I, I, you know, yes, it is. I, I'm gonna, no, it's not. <laughs> that, he certainly looked to me like that that should be ruled as a catch. I mean, Stephen Scott, who was formerly a catcher, had to come a long, long way. Oh, and I, I'm, you I know, thought he had it long enough. Most definitely. I mean, <laughs> yeah, if this was football, you say you didn't complete the process. <laughs> but then you say the but, ground can't cause a fumble yeah, either. <laughs> thankfully, in baseball, we don't have that mess to deal with. And Tim Corbin quickly out to discuss things with third base umpire Joseph Smith. It looked to me like he, he clearly had the ball. He touched the ground with it, came off the ground. The glove came off the ground. He still had the ball secured, took a couple steps, and on the acrobatic tumble is when the ball came out. I believe that's second base umpire Tyler Simpson, I should say, and he would have the best angle at it. And we're going to have our first challenge. Again, both coaches now get two challenges through the first seven innings, and the umpires take over. And this will be looked at back in Birmingham, and they'll get a chance to see some of the same angles that we just showed you. This process has gone quicker this year with Birmingham getting involved as you see Scott coming on. Has it, has it, still has it, and then it spills out. What do you think? I'm, I'm going to stick with, with, I firmly believe that's a catch. I mean, I don't know how far you have to go. If, if he was running without the tumble and he was just running toward the center fielder, and, and and the ball came out as he was running eight steps later. Is is that a catch or I, I believe that's a catch too. So mm -hmm. again, it's it's not football. Different different rules apply here. The other th key thing to keep in mind: the call on the field 
was a no catch, so you have to have indisputable video evidence to overturn it. One of the many things that are now reviewable in college baseball this year, catch or no catch, obviously, the situation here. And we will get the verdict, and they're going to hold tight and say hit. So it'll be a leadoff double for John Cable. I guess, I guess the act was not complete with him coming to a full stop and, and going to, to take the ball out to make the throw. I, I just know as a former outfielder to run that far and make that, that catch in that much right. of a difficult fashion, I would want that to be an out. Sure. I mean, you know a thing or two about I, plays like that. You played several years in college and in the majors in the outfield. I don't believe the rules have changed that much about what was the catch when you played versus now. I, I, I tell you. You're biting your tongue. Catch I can, or I no can catch, feel it. It was a fabulous <laughs> effort. The, the effort was was incredible. I, I'll give him that. Uh, here's the freshman Shane Marshall, Marshall, the catcher. The count evens up. One ball, one strike. Marshall out of Naples, Florida. Big swinger, four of his eight hits have been for extra bases. And, of course, he's filling in for a guy they hope to have back soon. That's Mason Meadows, their regular catcher, who had that scary injury. One and two. Back to the screen by Marshall. The catcher, of course, that I'm talking about, who they do not have the services of, Mason Meadows, when he fouled back a pitch on a swing, not on a bunt, but on a swing, and it actually fractured his orbital bone. But he has been taking BP and has been in the bullpen and sometimes even working with pitchers in between innings and Coach Strickland telling us, don't be surprised if you see Mason Meadows back soon. Maybe not today, but soon. And that's great news for Georgia fans. One, two to the freshman Marshall. Cuts and misses, chased one there. And that'll be the first out of the second. Going back to that catch. In this case, rule no catch. The release of the baseball by rule has to be intentional and voluntary. So from that standpoint, the ruling is Scott certainly didn't intentionally have the ball spill out. And so therefore ruled a no catch and upheld by replay. Hmm. I, and my I man can't David Delucci has gone silent I, I, on me. I, I, I can't argue with the, the fact that that's the rule. I can't argue with that. Yeah, how much judgment goes into what well, we know the letter of the law. That's right. But how much subjectivity goes into a play like that? Meanwhile, Kumar Rocker has not gone strike one on anybody. Keeps working from behind the count, and that has been the issue this year for the freshman. Gets behind and not necessarily walks. He only has six walks this year. But you get behind in the count and then you become predictable. Fastball counts and he's been hit pretty hard to the tune of an ERA of six and a whip of nearly two and a half. One-one to Rogers. Breaking ball takes a bite out of the outside corner. That's the pitch right there. That if he can get that over and if he can locate it, it, it will make his fastball even more effective. And, and, and the competition and the level of athletes at the SEC is is much different than high school. So when you come here, every one of these guys can hit a 95 mile an hour fastball. Smoked down the right field line, a base hit. Cable got off to a slow start. He's going to get waved anyway. The throw will come into second. Georgia strikes first. And how about the freshman, Cheney Rogers?
hot shot off of Cheney Rogers' bat. This is the fastball right here. Down and in for a left-hander. This is your dream pitch. This is what guys practice off the tee when they go to bed at night. That's the pitch they think about. And that's case in point right there. Fastball, flat, straight fastball to an SEC hitter. Gets turned around in a hurry. Now another freshman, part of three straight freshmen in the lineup, Brandon Jernigan in left field. And Jernigan takes strike one on the outer half. Jernigan out of Brunswick, Georgia, earned all state honors in both baseball and football at Glenn Academy. Some of the best wheels on the team, very fast. Two for two yesterday with a couple of steals. Comebacker up the box and into center field. Rogers coming home. Georgia has a lead, two to nothing here in the second. Back-to-back -back RBIs by true freshman. Georgia consistently gets the whole team involved and the whole team can contribute to wins right here. Two very mature approaches for freshmen, especially at this part of the season, to drive the ball right back up the middle on an off-speed pitch that hung up in the zone. Not trying to do too much to it, just put the ball up the middle to get yourself an RBI and your team up by two. Now the nine-hole hitter, the junior, Tucker Maxwell. I mentioned three straight freshmen, and of course two of them coming through with RBI hits here. Scott Strickland told us before the game at eight, you know, these were guys, if you would have asked me in September, I wouldn't, I wasn't even sure they'd be on the roster. They wouldn't make the 27-man travel team. But because of the injuries, they've had to rely heavily on some freshmen. And they've been getting great production out of their young players. It's repetitions, right? I mean, these guys, you, you don't come to a Georgia or Vanderbilt or an SEC program without being capable of being a good impact ball player. All of these guys are impact ball players. It's the matter of giving them reps and swings. There's no substitute for live pitching. There's no substitute for live fielding. And as a freshman, that may be the difference between a freshman and a junior and a senior is the fact that he just doesn't have as many reps. But when you have freshmen that are constantly playing because of an injury or because they've earned the right to, this part of the season, they're more mature and they know the game a lot better. So you're going to see more comfortable swings. You're going to see better decisions on the base pass. It's all a development from start to finish. Coach Strickland has done that throughout his career, and this team is a prime example. Tucker Maxwell enjoying a career year. 14 career home runs. Down on the count, 0-2. Tough to lay off that one just off the outside corner, but he does. One ball, two strikes, one out, one on. Georgia already with two in against the flame-throwing freshman Kumar Rocker. Rocker, again, a tremendous story. Vanderbilt has become accustomed to this where you've got Kids out of high school turning down literally millions of dollars of what would have been a first-round draft pick to play at Vanderbilt. Kumar's mom, Lalitha Lou for short, of Indian descent, told Tim Corbin during the recruiting process, I don't know what you're hearing, but my kid is coming to school. Education very important in her background and basically told everybody, including scouts, and of course Pops, Tracy Rocker, I don't care how much money is on the table, my boy is going to get an education, and what better place to do it than Vanderbilt. And Kumar Rocker, who you know, was an 18-year-old kid who certainly has aspirations of playing pro ball, she knows, and Tim Corbin can tell you, you go three years to Vanderbilt, you polish up your skills, more money will likely will be waiting for you as a junior mm -hmm. first-round draft pick, and as you can tell anybody, David DeLucci, 
life in the SEC is a little more glamorous than those 12-hour bus rides in low A ball. Mm, no question. And the crowds are bigger. <laughs> and the crowds stadiums are, are better. And the facilities are nicer. <laughs> it's not even close. I mean, look look at what we're building around the SEC with, in the east with Kentucky. And, and, uh, and, you're, and you're right. It's, it's an investment, right? It's an investment, and he will, he will reap the benefits of the investment of going, turning down pro money, going to college. We sometimes undervalue a college degree in education. That's been left off the table throughout all of these conversations. That is extremely valuable. And then this young man in three years, as he develops physically, mentally, and emotionally, we leave that out sometimes too, the sky is the limit. I mean, we're looking at a, a potential big leaguer that is going to refine his skill and get better and better. His velocity is going to get up. He's going to command the strike zone better. Oh, one to Shepard upstairs to the junior shortstop. And you think about it in three years, having more of an education, and who knows where the sign-in bonuses are going to be in three years. Good I mean, point. look, we got Bryce Harper signing 300 plus million, Mike Trout 400 plus million. Where is the sign-in bonus going to be? So. Uh, you follow Alex Bregman and what he did going to school and some of these other guys, it's going to pay off. Soft fly to left center. Coming on is Scott, and this time he'll hold on. Side retired, but not before the Bulldogs played a pair. We head to the third, 2-0 Georgia. Interesting this year in the coaches poll in college baseball, all the polls for that matter, a resurgence for the Pac-12, UCLA and Stanford, a rubber game today. NC State, boy, don't play the Wolfpack in a one-run game. You're going to wind up losing. They've been almost unbeatable in that spot. Vandy, Arizona State, Oregon State, more Pac-12, Georgia, Mississippi State and Arkansas, and then Louisville out of the ACC right now in the top ten. I just had Texas Baylor the other night. I would tell you the Big 12 is having a resurgent year. Baylor, Texas, Oklahoma State. Texas Tech, of course, the favorite to win that league. That's a good, deep league. So I, I think we're seeing a little more balance this year in college baseball, geographically speaking, as Infante digs in. Senior Julian Infante, the, the struggles well-documented last year after a terrific sophomore year. The batting average still below the Mendoza line. However, he has blasted three home runs in his last 19 at-bats, including a long ball yesterday that was a no-doubter to left field. And here's a guy, David DeLucci, who last year might have had a little bit of draftitis, and you as a former player, as a highly sought-after junior, know a thing or two about that. Yeah, it... it um Unfortunately, you, you get wrapped up in, in your surroundings and who's sitting in the stands and, and what are they writing about you? How was my day-to-day? -day? How was my BP? We start putting a lot of emphasis on things that, that we didn't normally used to do. We overthink our swing. And Fonte is, is a young man that cares deeply about his team, probably more of a team guy than he is an individual. And at times, when, when you're so concerned about your surroundings, it takes away from your game. You put too much pressure on yourself, and you can't perform. And before you know it, you start looking at the scoreboard, and, and your, your batting average tumbles, and, and you're digging yourself a hole. You overthink yourself to try to get out of it. It gets worse and worse. You're concerned about with your draft stock. You also know that you're not driving in runs and hitting home runs, and and you're not helping your team out, and, and it, it just snowballs and becomes a big avalanche, and I think that's exactly what he went through because this young man is extremely capable and has done it as a sophomore, had a tremendous sophomore year, good freshman year. He can play, and he can play at the next level, but sometimes mentally it takes you out of your comfort zone and what you can do physically. Losey thought he had strike th three there instead. It's his third walk and a leadoff one at that to Julian Infante. The one thing that Coach Corbin and company told us about Infante throughout all the struggles last year, this year, the defense never suffered. And sometimes you see where it can. If you're mentally plagued by your offensive woes, that could lend itself 
into problems on the defensive side that has not happened to Infante. Has not happened at all. And, and the character, too. That's another thing he says is this guy mentors younger players. Doesn't matter if he's 4 for 4 or 0 for 4. He's a mentor, and he said no matter what his game is on a Sunday, he can count on the fact that on his own he will donate his time and go to the children's hospital on Monday. And you'll never know the difference between a fantastic game or a terrible game. The character of this young man is of the utmost quality, and this is a guy that you pull for. And, and as of late, he is the Infante that we expect and, and have come to, to watch throughout the years. He is, he's seeing the ball well, and he's helping his team out. I know that's pleasing him. No doubt. And when he barrels one, it goes a long, long way. You see the last seven games for Infante. He has found the power stroke. Three home runs after some lengthy struggles. Infante on the run, pitches low and inside, and Infante will easily take second base. How about that? He's got some giddy up in those wheels, too. Yeah, man. 6'3", 210 pounds, and he lumbers into second on the stolen bag. It's the jump. It's all on the jump, and sometimes when you have a power pitcher like Losey, he's going to wind up. He takes a little bit longer to deliver that ball and release it, and Fonte takes advantage of it. He says, guys, don't just talk about my power. I've got some <laughs> speed as well. Talk about my wheels. Cooper Davis walked in the first. He's now reached base in all 29 games he's played this season. Takes one at the knees there from Losi. We're talking about the intangibles of Infante. Losi is a guy that Scott Strickland will tell you is a coach's dream in terms of his leadership qualities, even when things are not going well. That's the true sign of leadership. Anybody can lead when you're doing well. More on that in a moment as the 2-1 misses. Tells a story. When he was a freshman, Losey went out there against College of Charleston in a key spot. Challenged one of the Cougar hitters who hit about a 450-foot home run. And Losey wound up having to leave the game early. Got rocked. Obviously was disappointed. Scott Strickland telling him, hey, I, I don't know if I, we're even going to see him in the dugout again. He's going to go take a shower and obviously be despondent. It's one slicing foul territory and out of play. He said Losey was the first guy to go back on the rail. He said, I kept hearing this voice saying, come on, guys, let's go. Come on, dogs, let's go. He looked over, and it was Tony Losey, who just got rocked, just had the adversity, but he's just that kind of kid who is all about the team yeah. and one of the biggest cheerleaders for his squad, whether things are going well or not. Love it. I love to hear stories like that. Love to hear the character and the chemistry. That's what makes you a championship team. Davis on the ground to first. Rogers will take it to the bag himself. Forward a third on the play is Infante. That's one of the things we love about college baseball, isn't it? I mean, that's sure. the difference. You spent many years in the big leagues, and I'm not saying that they don't care, but it's just it's a different mindset, isn't it? This is the last level. Let's be honest. Okay, once you get money involved and these guys make signing bonuses or they're getting paid or there's potential to be paid, you, you become an individual more than a team. You're more concerned with what you're doing. You want to help your team win, yes, but you're also worried about your stats. At this level, this is why we see so many players that get – get recruited as a pitcher that are moved to shortstop or as a catcher like Scott and moved to, to left. They'll do whatever it takes to help the team go to Omaha and win a national championship. And I believe this is the last level that you get that, that team camaraderie and that team chemistry as all for one, one for all. We're in this together. Omaha is, is our number one goal from the day they step on campus to the day they get drafted or graduate. It's all about helping the team win. Austin Martin in the two hole. The sophomore struck out his first time up. Scoring opportunity, the best of its kind for Vanderbilt today. A runner at third, less than two outs. But Martin quickly down on the count. No balls, two strikes. Martin came in leading the SEC in batting average and on base percentage. Ball two strikes now. To the young man out of Jacksonville, Florida. Right, 
Sizzler to second. This will play to run. Vanderbilt on the board. Two to one on the RBI ground out. There you go, sacrificing yourself for the team. Runner on third, try, just got to put the ball in play. Got to put the ball in play. If you can put it in play the way the infield was playing back, it's going to be an RBI, and the rest of that team appreciates appreciates that move. Now, does would Austin Martin like to have a base hit RBI? Absolutely. But right now he is satisfied that he's got his team back within one run. Vanderbilt so happy to have a healthy Austin Martin back in the lineup after a scary collision on the infield a couple of weeks ago. Blade in the box. Bases wiped clean. Two gone. J.J. walked his first time up. Talking about team camaraderie, that injury happened in the sixth inning trying to save a no-hitter. Mm -hmm. uh, was it Fellows or Hickman or one of the – I think it was Hickman maybe trying to carry his, his teammate to help him get a no-hitter on a ball that he collided with the shortstop on. J.J. Blade, he might have complained to the home plate umpire about that last pitch in Russian. He speaks it fluently. In addition to that, comes from a ridiculously athletic family. Brother Adam plays baseball at Penn. Cousin Alec ran track there. Cousin John runs track at Dartmouth. They need a lot of mantles for the trophies in the Blade household. 1-2. Challenged him at 95 miles an hour. Good job of protecting both sides of the plate. Losey trying to fastball in, down and in. And he goes away. Mile high pop up to center. Maxwell coming on. And he will send us to the bottom of the third where we will speak to Vanderbilt hurler Drake Fellows when we come back. He's the All-American and World Series champion, David DeLucci. I'm Mike Morgan. Great to be with you this Sunday afternoon from Athens. Bulldogs leading the Vanderbilt Commodores 2-1. Happy to be joined by one of the top pitchers in the SEC, Drake Fellows. You see the line score on Friday night from Drake Fellows. Seven innings pitched, just two earned runs. And that was a big win for you guys, Drake. How do you feel about this series overall? Yeah, that was a big one for us. Um, we came back on Friday and give it all the grizz. Uh, he came off the bench and hit a big homer for us, keep us in the game, and then everybody was, was doing good that way, and then Ethan came in big time uh, at the end and hit a, hit a nice home run as well, and then we had some clutch pitching from the back half from Zach King and uh, Tyler Brown to close it off. And Yesterday we kind of felt we fell short, but um, I feel like we're going to stay together here and we're, we're going to pull this one out. Two, three, four, two, three, four, two up in the Georgia lineup. Drake, we were talking just moments ago, David and I, about the chemistry of this Vanderbilt team, and we've seen so much of that over the years under Tim Corbin. Just, just talk about, kind of let us in the, the clubhouse a little bit and how you guys all get along and work together. Yeah, I think uh, we're all just one big, one big happy family here. Um, everybody is just, everybody gets along and everybody just gels together and everybody has a good time with each other. And we love this road being on the road as well because we're all in the same hotel, all all bonding together, uh, just in new atmospheres. And we're all kind of together in this on the road and just we're all uh, in the dugout as well. Just uh, staying our ground and just staying with each other, and it's just one big family. Hey, Drake, uh, you know, the term Vandy boys, that's that's what people use to describe you guys, and, and it's, it's kind of a way of life, right? So how does Coach Corbin set the tone and example for you guys to be Vandy boys? Um, I think just with the standards that we have here, uh, everybody is the upperclassmen just kind of do their, do their thing and show the young classmen how, how we do things around here and, and what it's like to be one of those Vandy boys. And I think everybody just embraces it and freshmen come up and kind of learn the ways from the older kids like the seniors and juniors that – that uh, walk around and just show them what it's all about. Drake, we were talking earlier about how this Vanderbilt program recruits internationally. Um, excuse me, nationally. What? Well, yeah, I could say internationally. Yeah. Who knows? In time, it might become that way. You do have a Canadian, of course, yeah. at the yeah. top of the lineup at Cooper Davis. But you're a young man out of Plainfield, Illinois. I'm guessing you didn't grow up a Vanderbilt fan. So how did you wind up choosing Vandy? 
I actually, I didn't grow up a Vanderbilt fan. I didn't even know that even what Vanderbilt was until, <laughs> until I started getting recruiting, uh, recruited. And <clears throat> Tim Corbin saw me in Fort Myers, Florida when I was pitching a game, and I actually hit a kid in the face that I remember was going to LSU, and I kind of broke his nose. And I think what he liked about me was I just came back after that and, and dialed in and just struck the next two guys out and didn't get phased by it. And then I came on a visit, and I, I love the city. I love the academics, and obviously I love Coach Corbin and all the staff, and then the rest was history. Drake Coach Corbin puts the, the pitcher from the previous night, the starter from the previous night, pencils him in, and pencil is the term, uh, as DH. Yeah. Uh, you've been in there. I, I hear you've embraced that. You've, you've waved to the fans when you've been introduced as the DH. What would your scouting report be if Coach Corbin actually let you become a hitter? Don't throw me the heater. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, we we enjoy it. Uh, he does it for a reason. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't know who's gonna who's gonna be DH in that day. He'll put us in there or, or at that time, so he'll put us in there just to throw the other team off or something like that. But yeah, don't throw me the heater. I'll get out. Of, I'll get out in front on it. But you you've got the number of like a, a non roster invitee in spring training, like a guy that gets some at bats in uh, in late March, trying to make the club 66. Kumar Rocker today with the number 80. This, these are not numbers we're used to seeing on pitchers or really any hitter on the roster. Where did you come up with that one? Uh, I didn't know. Uh, Coach Corbin actually gives us our numbers when we come in. We have no idea what number we're going to be. And I st still, to this day, I have no idea why I'm number 66. And I haven't asked him, but I, I'm just going to keep it. Is it. I mean, are we talking keep it long term, or are you eventually going to go to what was your favorite number? My favorite number was 23. I was always 23 growing up, but, hey, if it's working and it's, it's, it's sticking with me, everybody, I'm just embracing the number now. Um, I, it might be a long-term thing. You know, one of the things about your bio uh, stood out to me. I, I'm old enough to remember what it was like to try and battle a Rubik's Cube. I didn't think you guys had any idea what the heck that was, but, but you have solved a Rubik's Cube. It says that's your oddest talent. How in the heck did that get started? It was just someone I was younger, you know, you get those, you those toys as a kid and you always want to solve those puzzles and stuff like that. So, I mean, it was something I, was, I would do until I figured it out. I mean, I looked it up on YouTube, but I still did it anyway. Well, I, I hope to have that same feather in my cap at some. I still haven't solved it in, in, in 20 years. So you, you've <laughs> take already, the stickers off. Uh, yeah, take oh, the stickers off. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. uh, see, David DeLucci always looking for the edge. <laughs> Drake Fellows, you, you have the edge. Best of luck the rest of the way. Congratulations on your performance on Friday. Appreciate it, guys. You got it. Drake Fellows kind of have to take the time from the Vanderbilt dugout. And one of the more likable young men. Again, that goes back to the, the, the chemistry. You heard him talking about life on the road. That's really when you're forced to bond, whether you want to or not. It's when you find out how well you get along as a family. You're sharing seats on a bus, hotel rooms, and everything in between, team meals. And there's no lack of that for Vanderbilt. L.J. Talley at the dish. Riley King still at first with one gone here in the home half of the third. A 2-1 Georgia lead, rubber game of the series. Georgia right now in first place all alone atop the SEC at 8-3. Vandy not far behind at 7-4. Rocker with 48 pitches now under his belt, so hardly an efficient count for the freshman right-hander. And oftentimes you, you see as a big power pitcher throws a firm, straight fastball. Sometimes when when their arm gets tired, you'll actually see a little more movement because they're not trying to overthrow and that arm will get loose. Lined and snared by Ray, the throw to first, double play. Great play in the field by Harrison Ray. Now the side is retired. We head to the fourth with Georgia up two to one. Pitcher's best friend is a double play, but this time it started in the air. Nice job to concentrate on that sinker to finish off the double play. Bandy coming up to bat. 1-0-0 zero, zero for the Commodores, 2-4-0 for the Georgia Bulldogs. Kind of game we thought it would be close early on as we get you set for the top of the fourth. We went from overcast to filtered sunshine, and now the sunglasses may be a little SPF 30 dabbed on the 
faces of the fans here at the friendly confines of Foley Field. Scott Clark and Ray. Middle of the lineup up against Tony Losey. Steven Scott, the senior, took a backward K his first time up. Out of Cary, North Carolina, parents Curtis and Donette both attended Vanderbilt. So not a very difficult decision to decide where he wanted to go to school. Georgia defensively putting on the shift. We're seeing more and more of this now filtering down from the major leagues to the collegiate ranks. Yeah, you know, what's interesting to me is it, it's it's a shift with two strikes on, on the batter. And, and a lot of times, back when I played, it used to be you go the other way because <laughs> you're trying to put the ball in play. And, and more often than not, they hit it to the opposite field. Scouting reports are so much more advanced today than they used to be. And, I mean, they just they know everybody's hot zone, cold zone. and spray charts here and there but it's, it's interesting to see a shift to the pull side with two strikes I had a, a similar situation like this the other night in the Texas Baylor game a quality hitter at the plate a lefty same shift a two strike count he dropped down a bunt to the left side and it was just mm -hmm. like taking candy from a baby yeah it's there if you want it hacking away is Scott and he goes down swinging Two strikes, trying to trying to just battle at the plate, protect the zone, and then the pitcher throws you a fastball. It looks so good out of his hand. It's 95 miles an hour, and anything above the belt, chest level at 95 is extremely difficult to catch up to. One out for the catcher, Philip Clark, the sophomore. Borderline pitch misses for ball one. Losey looking good here early on. What a luxury to have a guy like Tony Losey with this kind of stuff that can go on a Sunday. You're talking about a guy that's averaging 11 and a half strikeouts per nine innings. So swing and miss stuff. A guy who could be a Friday night starter for a lot of teams. Dad played minor league baseball, was a pitcher in the Cubs organization at the same time as Mark Kingston, the head coach now at South Carolina. Went around, two balls and two strikes. And you see the effect that a 97 mile an hour fastball has that the batter thinks that he's got to get started earlier he gets his bat going and he can't hold up when he realizes that it's a slider or a splitty down and below the strike zone he's already committed his, his brain has already committed his body is already committed and there's nothing he can do about it Spoils that 2-2 pitch from Losey, does Philip Clark. Clark with Harrison Ray waiting on deck. Vanderbilt down by a run here in the fourth. Breaking ball on a beauty. Through the back door for strike three. Tuesday night at 7 Eastern, 6 Central here on the SEC Network. It's the big rivalry game between Georgia Tech and the seventh-ranked Georgia Bulldogs from right here at Foley Field. SEC Baseball also available on the ESPN app. Mike Morgan with David DeLucci. That game has become signature as well as Georgia battling Clemson. You won't find many programs in America that play a more difficult out-of-conference schedule than Georgia. Rocketed to center field off the bat of Ray. Maxwell is there to put the squeeze on it for the third out. Two to one, our score, Georgia in the lead, middle of the fourth. Could not ask for better weather this Sunday, could not ask for a better series. Vanderbilt and Georgia 
Two teams at or near the top of the SEC, a rubber game of this three-game series. And joining us now, a big factor in the win for Georgia yesterday, the pride of Royston, Georgia, C.J. Smith. C.J., how are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Now, I, I understand your path to Athens was a little bit unorthodox in that you were homeschooled. So when you're homeschooled, how do you get the, the chance to play and, and get yourself ready from a prep career to play at this level? Uh, travel ball, for sure. For sure, travel ball. Well, give us a little bit of what did that entail. So you're, you're at a Royston. Where are you traveling to to get to travel ball? Uh, travel ball, I played in Johns Creek, so about an hour and a half away. That's pretty good haul. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are you, are you driving or is mom taking you? Uh, the first couple of years, it was my mom driving me. And then after that, she said, you're a big boy. It's time to put the big boy pants on. <laughs> Well, you certainly put on the, the big boy pants yesterday. Just just talk about your performance. Again, because of the injuries, you've been forced into the rotation. Was it feeling pretty good for you yesterday? Absolutely. Yeah, it was feeling really good. I mean, I'm still waiting on Fonte's ball to come out of orbit. But <laughs> other than that, yes, sir, it felt really good. It's CJ, first of all, to, to the fans that don't necessarily know what's on your face right there, those are flip sunglasses, right? Can, can you show the world how those sunglasses work real quick? Oh, that'll work there, well there in we Del go. Boca Vista. That was so, pretty sweet. And, and I know you're a two-way player. Yes, sir. But are you wearing the flip sunglasses right now because of the peanuts that are coming at you and, and, and all the shrapnel going on in there? Yeah, no, these guys are fools. These guys are acting <laughs> crazy behind me. What about <laughs> being a two-way player, and I know you've gotten a lot more reps this year uh, on the mound. Being a two-way player, how does that help you either – at the plate or at the mound, and having the mentality that you know exactly what the other pitcher or batter is doing. Uh, I wouldn't know about knowing what the pitcher or batter is doing, but, I mean, it definitely helps keep me uh, level-headed for sure. It's, it's, it's a humbling sport like, for sure, and it helps, you know, when you're struggling one, you can, you know, try and pick it up with the other one. Which do you prefer, hitting or pitching? Uh, I'd probably say pitching. Really? Yes, sir. Usually we get the other answer on that one. Uh, round ball, round bat's pretty hard to hit. Yeah. I figured that out the hard way. <laughs> you make more money as a pitcher, too. Uh, it's more fun for me to uh, pitch than hit, for sure. Yeah. That, that being said, do you want to get some more ABs? Oh, absolutely. You know, anyway, I can help the team out to win, for sure. And if that means not no more ABs, then no more ABs. But for sure, I would love to, uh, for sure, for sure, get that batting average up a little bit before, you know, PO hood. Begins. CJ, I'm curious in the recruiting process. Again, you're you're a Georgia kid. I'm sure the Bulldogs was was were close and, and dear to your heart growing up. But as you know, before you arrived on campus, this was a program that had really been struggling. Did you take it upon yourself as as this would be a challenge to go ahead and get Georgia baseball back? What was the sales pitch like from Coach Strickland? Honestly, it's pretty easy. I grew up, like you said, a diehard Georgia fan. I was, I grew up in the stands here at Foley Field, so honestly, the sales pitch for him was pretty easy. And the camaraderie for you guys now after turning the corner, great season last year, another good one so far this year. Would you say it's at an all-time high in that clubhouse? Uh, absolutely. The camaraderie here is amazing. I mean, everybody, top to bottom, just a brother. It really is a brotherhood. You know, it's a cliche brotherhood thing, but it really is. It really is. Everybody loves each other. What, what, what do you – the, the, the series this weekend has been sold out. So you as a player, what, what does that make you feel like? You know that the fan base is behind this team. That's a great feeling for sure. You know, it's it's a testament to, to the way we've turned it around, like you said, and that for the fans to come out here and support us, it's been awesome. Final question, CJ. You know, we travel a lot on the road around the SEC. We're always looking for a good place to eat. If, if I wind up in Royston, Georgia, where, where am I going? Royston, Georgia? Oh. If you're going in Royston, Georgia, there's a good Mexican restaurant right by Bill's. Okay. I'll take your word. Hey, chips and salsa, you can never go wrong with that. Absolutely. CJ, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you all. <laughs> the flip sun sunglasses on full display as he's being bombarded by sunflower seeds. Nice job, CJ, to be locked in. Taking a series victory with an 8-0 win over Auburn. LSU splits the doubleheader to win the series against Texas A&M and those great arms, mostly southpaws for the Aggies. And Ole Miss sweeps Florida. Now, there's two ways to look at this. Tip your hat to the Ole Miss Rebels. But how about this for a stat that's going to knock your socks off, David DeLucci, assuming you're wearing a pair? Yes, I am. In Florida's last two road series, that would be against Vandy, 
and Ole Miss, that staff has surrendered 74 runs. Oh, 74 holy. runs in six games. Those are just not the kind of numbers we associate with a Florida Gator staff under Kevin O'Sullivan. But they've got a lot of young guys that are still figuring things out on the mound right now. That, that, that is hard, hard to imagine. And I know with, with the staff that, that – Florida is used to, to running out there. They're, they're used to dominant starting pitchers. It always starts with that. Their, their ERA is up. Offense is, is okay, but it, it all revolves around the pitching staff. And there are times when you bring in a, a crop of freshmen and you may get a singer and a co-R, but you may have to develop them, and it may take a couple years. You, 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 you can't completely count on freshmen coming in to carry the load and I think Florida may be at that point this year where they're going to take some knocks but it may take them a year or two to, to get back in the Florida that we know that they can be that was the seventh three ball count for Losey but he does get the out off the bat of Ethan Paul first one down here in the top of the fifth updated standings again Georgia all alone in first place at eight and three if Vandy wins this game wins the series a five-way tie in first place if you include Arkansas, LSU, and Ole Miss. There's Florida at four and eight. I mean, that almost looks like a like a typo. Like we're just not used to seeing that any time in the last decade. But one thing we learn about college baseball with the turnover that you have, we've seen it happen to Texas, to LSU. You name a heavyweight program, and I'll show you a program that has had a down year. Now, down is relative. Down for Florida might be they still find their way into a regional, but they have to travel. But still, by Gator standards under Sully, this has been a down year thus far. Yeah, and you're going to have to imagine that they're going to drop out of the top 25. And I, who knows how long it's been since we've seen Florida out of that. And what you hope for, and, and we see LSU go through something like this, it seems like every single year, and, and they catch fire toward the end of the season. Mississippi State did that last year. And what you hope is there's no J.J. Swartz. You know, J.J. Swartz was the backbone of that team. You hope one of those older players, a Maldonado or one of those guys, can can carry the load and, and lead the way for this team to get hot. The talent is there. The talent is definitely there. Can they get hot toward the end of the season? There's still some games to play, but if you look at those those standings, it's a two-horse race. It I mean, really it's is. It's Vandy and George. I, 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 and that's something I don't think we would have anticipated maybe at the start of the year. This ball is scorched in the left center field by Ty Duvall, the junior. Will coast in the second with a one-out double off of Tony Losey. Ty Duvall does a fantastic job of getting a, a good drivable fastball that's on about the outer third of the plate. He keeps that front shoulder compact, keeps that front shoulder in, and, and shoots that ball to left center field. For a lefty, that's how you get locked in. And Duvall's a career 299 hitter coming into this year. The numbers were down to 222 before that hit. You know eventually he's got some more hits left in him. And this is junior campaign. And now, speaking of a guy who's been heating up in his senior year, Julian Infante, who walked and stole second his first time up. The equalizer. Any, any, very few hitters are going to go up there looking curveball first pitch. Nasty curveball at that. You're not going to get a whole lot of swings. And if you do, it's not going to look pretty. And, and as Infante did, the smart thing to do is to let that ball go for a strike. Fonte, four-year guy out of Miami, Florida. Eye-popping numbers as a sophomore, and then you figure as a draft-eligible junior, the numbers are only going to go up. That's usually the case, but not always. We talked about some of the pressure that a guy has in a draft year. Took a dip back and then started off the season in a less than auspicious manner, but appears to be heating up here in the last week and a half. Three home runs in his past 19 at bats, a walk here in the third. So he's seeing the ball better. And when he connects, when he barrels a ball, it's going to go a long way. It's pretty special.
scorched foul. The trials and tribulations of Julian Infante. Up, down, down again, and then they're hoping back up in the second half of this college baseball season, the senior one at that for Infante. Big 2-2 two -two pitch due to Julian Infante. Breaking ball hammered foul. Infante, I mentioned out of Miami, high school All-American, like seems like everybody on the Vanderbilt roster, it's almost like a prerequisite. <laughs> he set the Florida single season home run record during the BB core era with 13, and that is a key distinction as we have seen the transformation of bats and balls in a high school and collegiate game. I think we finally hit that sweet spot. Yes, I agree. Went from gorilla ball to dead ball, and now the play is much more true. Again, he is crushing baseballs, but he's got to straighten it out a little bit. That almost dented a car. So this is where you have to be careful. If, if you're Losi right here, you, you've shown that breaking pitch, not only on the first pitch of this A-B, but two times in a row. He's gotten two decent swings, and Fonte is a little out front, but – but for a, a hitter, the more you show him that off-speed pitch, the more he's taking note of the break, of the velocity, and he's getting himself dialed in. And that's probably what this mound meeting is right here. Be very careful because Infante is, is, is dialing in on that breaking pitch, and it's time to change your grip or move to another pitch. Now, pitching coach Sean Kenny saw the same thing you did. I mean, foul ball after foul ball being jerked foul but stung. And if he straightens one out, it can easily go from 2-1 to one to 3-2 Vandy. But th these are the two that he missed, and watch him turn on them. Yeah, the, the, the location, in, anything up high, that ball's not going to break as much. And when it, it comes, it comes right down to the belt level, which Alf uh, Infante has, as of late, done a great job of crushing those pitches belt high. We got a chance to see one at Vandy that I don't know if it's – had it not been for a building behind left field, uh, it would have never come down. Seventh pitch of the at-bat. Swing and a miss, strike three. Came back with the gas and blew it by him. Good fastball. Showed the curveball multiple pitches in a row and then you come back outside corner not only was it a good choice to go with the fastball but the location was excellent down and away very difficult to hit especially after you saw two breaking pitches up and in fifth strikeout for Losi. and back to the top of the order for the third time it's davis who has walked and grounded out duvall still off the bag at second he represents the tying run here in the fifth Sprayed to left, but Jernigan is right there for out number three. Tony Losi recovers in a big way and no lack of emotion on that young man's face. Now we talked about it in terms of Vanderbilt, the great young arms that they get that turn down the money and come to Nashville. The SEC is loaded with them, including JT Ginn of Mississippi State. Remember, he was a 30th overall pick the Los Angeles Dodgers and wound up turning down the money. What a find he's been in Starkville. Looking forward to seeing him in a couple weeks over there at the new dude. As if the old dude wasn't nice mm. enough. Hey, what, Foley Field went over a, a transformation a few years ago. I remember Chris Burke and I were here for the first game right after they redid this ballpark, and they, they got their money's worth. It's... Got some personality, got some bells and whistles that we can't see inside for the players. Behind home plate, you've got those kind of VIP seats over there. And uh, in the bowels of the stadium, all the stuff that as a player you would want. Yeah, it doesn't get much better than those seats. That's where you and I need to be at some yes. point, David DeLucci. Yes. And the Foley Field has undergone a, a heck of a transformation. It's wedged in here right in the 
middle of cam campus. We're not far from Stegman Coliseum or Sanford Stadium. You see Kudzu Corner over there. It's a cool spot. Catch a game. I was here back in 2006 for a Super Regional. Packed house at about 100 degrees. That is a foul ball off the bat of Maxwell. I say no breeze because I saw history. South Carolina came in here with guys like Justin Smoke and Reese Havens and hit five straight home runs in game one of a Super Regional. Still an NCAA record. One of the many memories here at Foley. Can of corn hauled in by Davis. Of course, they would have enjoyed a better memory last season when they hosted a regional. But the Duke Blue Devils had other ideas in mind. Griffin Conine, the son of the former major leaguer Jeff Conine, got hot late. And Duke behind a lefty by the name of Graham Stinson, who you'll hear come draft day, upset Georgia as a number eight national seed. So that's left a little bit of a bitter taste in the mouth of a lot of these players that know they're good enough to go further than a regional. And I think this year the goal is pretty simple. It's Omaha. Yeah, and I, I love the transformation of the program. And, and I look back, the, the way Georgia Bulldogs finished 2017 was incredible beating ranked teams, three ranked teams in a row, and it carried over next year. It's only going to get better this year. A quick one, two, three inning. Just 11 pitches for Rocker. He's starting to settle in. 2-1 game. Clean ball game thus far and an entertaining one at that. Georgia leading Vanderbilt 2-1. And the third game, the rubber game of this series here at Foley Field in Athens. First place on the line, Georgia Bulldogs trying to get a little more cushion top the mountain of the SEC. So far, they've gotten all they could ask for out of Tony Losey. Maybe the best Sunday starter in the SEC, certainly one of the better ones in the country. He is working on a one-hit performance thus far. And taking on a big part of the order right here, 2-3-4, Martin, Blade and Scott. As you see, the pitch count now 92 under the belt of Losey. That one might have taken a funky bounce and caught Marshall. Oof. They got under the mask. Boy, if you're Georgia, you've got to be thinking, we already had something bad happen to Mason yep. Meadows when he was swinging a bat, and that looked awfully painful. Yeah, it, it, it was a funny hop, the way that ball just it squirted under the mask. And, and we see in today's game, that's the old school mask right there. Man, that'll wake you up. I can promise you, looked like he was in the jugular is where he got hit. Make your nose run, your eyes water, your catcher. Unfortunately, these guys are battering Rams behind home plate. they got to be brick walls. And the gear doesn't cover everything, especially the side of your neck. That may make him consider one of those hockey masks. You know, that's the other kind of kind of mask that the catchers wear. Right. And, and that's the reason they wear it is, is to cover more of their neck area. Did you ever consider playing catcher? Fortunately, I'm left-handed throwing, so so I didn't have to consider it. But I can tell you this. I Stefano did it lefty. Come well, on yeah. Now. I've tried like for little league games and BP and stuff, and as soon as that batter, it's not blocking balls that that, that I had issues with. As soon as the batter swings, I blink. I'd have no chance of catching that ball. Bullpen heating up now for Georgia. It's a big inning, and potentially the last one for Tony Losey, who's flirting with a hundred pitches. Christofak and Glover. Christofak is a guy that could close easily. Probably going to be without their flame-throwing freshman who we saw yesterday into center field. And flagged down by Maxwell. They've got some arms out of the bullpen. And they hope to have Ryan Webb back. He is not going to be shut down the rest of the year, but 
Coach Strickland telling us today before the game, I mean, he's as talented as any guy they have in the bullpen. A lefty who still has a 1.86 ERA and has been clutch in the past. So this Georgia team, as good as they are, I mean, they've got a bunch of guys that are on the shelf right now that they expect to get back. Mm -hmm. Here's Blade. You know he could tie it with one swing. Rockets won the left center, and <laughs> Jernigan on the track. That ball was stung so hard. I mean, by the time he caught it, it's still the exit velocity was still strong. Those balls will scare you when you're an outfielder, and, and off the bat, you know it's crushed. And, and it's got some slice to it because it's the lefty. You know that, that it's going to slice and you don't want to overrun it. And then you realize it's, it's three-quarters away there and it's not slowing down. It's still, it's still coming at you hot. Losey just threw his 100th pitch of this Sunday afternoon. He's only allowed one hit. The one run came on an RBI ground out by Austin Martin in the third. Scott looks at one just out of the zone. Scott's 0 for 2 with a couple of strikeouts. Off the thumbs, a little pop up, and Losey will give way to the first baseman, Rogers. Side retired. Georgia clinging to a one run lead. This is not your typical Sunday pitching duel. Rocker and Losey have both been as good as advertised, maybe even a little bit better. Remember, Rocker had struggled in his last start against Tennessee, but he has brought his A game to the table today. So too has Losey. Losey has already hit 100 pitches. Rocker might hit that mark rather soon, but it's great to see on a Sunday. You remember what it was like when you played at Ole Miss? David, I mean, on a Sunday, you guys are licking your chops because you'd face a guy who maybe a swing guy or a freshman who was still learning the craft. Rocker, by the way, only at 75 pitches, but the depth is so good in this league that you might face a future first rounder on a Sunday. Yeah. This guy right here, he, he is going to be a future first rounder. There, were, When I played, and let's not say when that was, but it was a few <laughs> years ago, that's the day you knew you were going to put up big offensive numbers, mm -hmm. right? And, and you were going to have to win in a slugfest, 10 to 9, you know, 12 to 11, no longer. And not by these two guys today have been fantastic attacking the strike zone, commanding their pitches. I am extremely impressed with both of these young men. And, and, and another thing I look at now is the pitching matchups week in and week out. We're still in a part of the season where some of these teams have TBA on their Sunday starter to be announced. Not on Vandy and not on Georgia because of these two guys right here. A leadoff walk to King, second time he's reached. Meaty part of the lineup up with Shunk and then Tally on deck. Little bouncer to second and bobbled and everybody is safe. Oh, it looked like it had at least the potential to be a double play off the bat. Surely you turn one, but Harrison Ray didn't look it into the glove and it could be a costly error here in the sixth. Yet you, you hate, and we talked about how great these two pitchers have been pitching. This is a ball that should have been a routine double play, and you hate to see, as you saw Rocker bouncing up and down on the mound, he knew that, that that's exactly what he wanted, was a ground ball to get the double play. And Vanderbilt, once again, this has been kind of haunting Vanderbilt as some defensive miscues that are uncharacteristic of this team in the past. And what you hope is you don't squander the effort of that young man, Rocker, who has pitched a fantastic game. That's pitching coach Scott Brown chatting. Again, both pitchers today have been really good. And when you're talking about potential high draft picks, you're talking about guys with swing and miss stuff. And that's it. it it's, it's set up by the fastball. The 95-plus mile-an-hour fastball allows that off-speed pitch to, to either freeze or to get swings that you normally wouldn't. Losey, very similar. Starts with the fastball. He's hit 96 today several times. And then he can also put you away with the breaking pitch right there. Back door's a slider. Fastball outside corner. Great location. 
great velocity. This is exactly what you like to see in a college baseball game. Rocker with six strikeouts, Losey with five. The error could light the fuse here for Georgia. Potential big inning in a game where runs have been hard to come by. And I'm going to tell you something else that, that that error did was it keeps Kumar Rocker out there and his pitch count is climbing. Instead of pitching right now with two outs and nobody on base, he's going to have to work even harder. So you you may, even though you might have wanted to get him through this inning to save your bullpen and give them one more inning to warm up, you may have to go there a little bit earlier because of that error. Chase pitch, Tally not buying it. Double barrel action in the Vanderbilt bullpen. Fisher and Huff, righty and lefty. Rocker, the son of the former Washington Redskin and All-American at Auburn, Tracy Rocker. His father met his wife and mother of Kumar while he was playing for the Redskins. She's from the state of Maryland. Right now, Pop's probably sweating it out along with Kumar. They're in a key spot, two on, nobody out. And a 3-0 count. Outer third for a strike. Good pitch, and he needed that strike too. And another thing we need to, to realize is, is going into these athletes and these pitchers and, and what they're thinking right now, it's, it's human nature to think he should have no one on base with two outs. It's hard to block that out and attack the hitter. And sometimes these pitchers will let that affect the next batter. Kumar Rocker has done a great job of going from 3-0 to 3-2. Shows the makeup of this young man. LJ Talley has been the best and most consistent hitter for Georgia all year long. And he smashes one to right field here. Riley King will get the wave home. He'll score, and Georgia has a two-run lead. L.J. Talley has been the leader of this team offensively. It's a fastball that's down and in. Kumar Rocker took a little bit off of it, but it was down and in once again on that left-hander swing. It typically has a, a little loop in his swing. He's going to get to that pitch right there. And Talley shows why he's leading this team offensively in many different categories. Boy, has he been special in this his senior year. He has saved his best for last. And now Rocker, the standout from North Oconee High School, about a dozen miles away. He's going to have to give the ball up here. Deserved a better fate. The inning really marred by the error at second base by Ray. Otherwise, who knows how it would look. But instead, after 84 pitches, Kumar Rocker will exit stage left. Georgia up by two and still something brewing here in the sixth. Nothing to be ashamed of today if you're Kumar Rocker pitched well and it had it not been for the error here in the sixth inning, he might still be out there. He'll cheer his team on the rest of the way. Georgia up by two runs and threatening to have a big inning here. Will not be easy, though. Vanderbilt loaded with arms, including a talented southpaw by the name of Hugh Fisher, the sophomore out of Eads, Tennessee. Yeah, this is an uncomfortable at bat. If, if you're a batter, especially a left-handed hitter, Fisher's got a three-quarter arm slot. Means he's going to throw his bat fastball with a lot of sink to it. He'll run that fastball up in, into the low to mid 90s. We've seen him get to 95. He's also working on an, a slider that is improving as well. It's going to be a sweeping slider. So, this young man, we talk about potential and ceilings. A lefty throwing the way that he does it also has a very bright future at the next level. Now the great find for Georgia, John Cable, who originally called Roswell Georgia home, not too far 
from here in Athens, but started off his career at Darton State. That's Google worthy. And then last year hit 349 at New Orleans before becoming a grad transfer here at Georgia. A big spot in this game, a chance to put a crooked number on the board here in the home half of the sixth inning. It won't be easy against Hugh Fisher. Yeah, that's not fair, right? First pitch slider, nasty slider, lefty on lefty. Good sequence right there, slider in. Shows Cable what, he, what he's got. It's going to keep him honest, and then he's going to try to pick away. More often than not, the left-handed pitcher is going to try to get the left-handed hit, hitter down and away. That's where his location is. That's where he's aiming for. Swing and a miss. Filthy. And when you have that in your arsenal, you don't have to rear back and throw that fastball, even though the fastball is, is just as dirty because of that heavy sink and the velocity he can throw it. But that's a swing and miss slider right there. Fisher, whose grandfather played football at West Virginia. Fisher decided baseball would be his sport of choice. Good looking, lanky lefty, all 6'5, 185 pounds of him. Cable has been clutched this year for Georgia. And misses at that one. Filthy, as you would put it, David DeLucci. An array of sliders. And, and one of the things that Fisher also does that makes him even more difficult to hit is he'll mix up the velocity on his sliders. The first one we saw, he took some off. That one was a little sharper slider, but he stayed on the outside corner of the plate. And when you're ahead of the batter, you don't have to hit that corner. You can go even off, extend the strike zone, and still get the swing. Now the freshman Shane Marshall. The backup catcher forced in a starter's role because of the injury to Mason Meadows, who again looks like he's very close to coming back for Georgia. Wouldn't be surprised if he gets to play in the midweek. Marshall squaring, now pulls it back. Georgia now with five hits on the day. They've gotten some traffic on the diamond, three runs in and hoping to have a big inning here to give Tony Losey and that talented Georgia bullpen a little more breathing room. Interesting right here. See Marshall square around and show Bunt with one out. Two times in a row. 95. What are you gearing up for here, uh, Dave? Man, I, I tell you, <laughs> if, if I'm the batter and I saw him unleash the sliders and the action the sliders had on Cable. Now, granted, he's a right-handed hitter, but really and truly, you, you you can't sit on one single pitch. Now you're seeing his fastball at 95 with good sink. High cheese, 97 miles an hour to complement that slider. You, you know, the, the, this is the, what makes hitting so difficult, right? As, as you heard C.J. Smith say, round ball, round bat, very difficult to do. But you've got to get your front foot down for 97 miles an hour because that's what he's topping out at. But you have to keep your hands back for the 70-mile-an-hour slider. And oftentimes, we see young hitters at this level that will sit in between the pitch. They don't want to be too early on a slider and too late on the fastball, so they'll sit in between. And if you sit in between, you can't hit neither. Mm. So sometimes it's best, and I never had – the knack of sitting one single pitch, but it might be the way to go when you're facing a guy as nasty as this. Swing and a miss. More nastiness out of the left hand of Hugh Fisher. Well, if he was guessing, you know, it, it had the velocity of the fastball. So if you're guessing fastball immediately out the hand, that's what you think fastball, but it was just out of the zone. 
but extremely. I can't tell you how difficult it is when you get down there field level and you're 60 feet, 6 inches, and you got a guy slinging from three quarters, fastballs and sliders. It is tough to hit. Just missing on the first offering to Cheney Rogers. What you can do is, is in, in all of these guys on Georgia and Vandy, they do a great job. They're on the top step watching the pitchers. They're taking mental notes. And if I'm a left-handed hitter, which I was, and I see Cable go up there and get a plethora of sliders that are down and away, that's what I'm looking for. If I'm going to dial it in on one pitch, I'm going to go down knowing that that's how he got the guy out in front of me. Swing and a miss. And then sometimes you still can't hit it. <laughs> that, I mean, that one's 84, so if you're gearing up for 97, which he has shown, and then he goes 84 on the slider, now what? He's going to slider again to a left-handed hitter. He, he's going to go slider again. He's going to go down and away with it. That one down to 83. And this would not be a fun guy to hit for a lefty. No, it kind, you know, it kind of <laughs> reminds me the way he slings the ball of, of Randy Johnson. Now, mm -hmm. he's, he's not as tall. He's definitely tall, but Randy was 6'11". Without the mullet, it's it's the, the arm slot and the way he's slinging the ball. Without the mullet and not quite 6'10", but still long and lanky at 6'5", a buck 85. He was much thinner last year. He made eight relief appearances as a freshman then put on some weight some much needed weight body filled out a little bit deuce is wild and the count fills up now on the freshman first baseman Cheney Rogers and to me this is where it becomes more difficult for the hitter because you're lefty you saw the way he pitched cable you're expecting that he's going to try to throw sliders now that you get three two with two outs and the runner on first is going to be going on motion to home plate now the question is is he going to try to go fastball he does not want to walk me can't afford to walk me is this the fastball right here swing and a miss it is not <laughs> It is that filthy slider. The flurry of strikeouts from Vanderbilt pitchers continues. Rocker had a half a dozen, and here comes Hugh Fisher. Shut down slider, one of the best that you'll see in college baseball to be able to do it not only to the lefties but the righties. Hugh Fisher is filthy. Vanderbilt coming to the plate. Hugh Fisher can crack a smile after striking out the side in a critical spot to hold it to two-run lead now for Georgia. Three to one our score. Top of the seventh about to unfold. There's Kumar Rocker. You know, a lot of young pitchers maybe that know they're not going to get the win. Maybe you don't have that leadership factor that we were talking about. That's not the case with Losey and Kumar Rocker. They'll be at the top of the railing there cheering their respective teams on. Losey, meanwhile, Already over 100 pitches and hoping to at least milk one more inning against this Vanderbilt offense, which has been held in check. Just one run on one hit for Vanderbilt. A lineup that's second in the league with eight runs a game. And it'll be Clark, Ray, and Paul up for the Commodores here in the road half of the seventh. Clark 0 for 2. Here we are, third time through the order, and I don't know if it's really helped against Tony Losey. As Coach Strickland told us before the game, that velocity, he's a velo guy that holds. He's not one of these guys that starts off at 97, 96, and then by the time you get to 100 pitches, he's down to low 90s. He's got the ability to sustain that fastball. Off the glove of Losey, reacts, why not? He's done everything else. <laughs> why not make a Blue Star play in the field as well? Tony Losey helping himself out. It may have bought him another hitter. 
but showing cat-like instincts off the mound. We talk about his velocity. We talk about the depth of his breaking pitches. How about the instincts to put a glove on that ball? And these pitchers wear some tiny, tiny gloves, but he gets enough on it to stop it and complete the out. How about the fast twitch movement by the 6'3", 240-pound junior out of Columbus, Georgia? Columbus is a town that's produced some pretty good players. How about Frank Thomas, Tim Hudson, just to name a couple? Pretty decent careers. Not bad. Those two guys. Tim Hudson, of course, along with Frank Thomas, two Auburn All-Americans. Not uncommon to see Huddy back at an Auburn game from time to time now that he's retired from Major League Baseball. 1-1 to Ray. Of course, Frank Thomas recently being inducted into the Hall of Fame. I have a feeling we're going to see some more SEC guys in Cooperstown pretty soon. Ray, the junior, way out in front of that offering from Losey. So, so this is young man right here. It's labeled as a power pitcher run the ball up to 97 miles an hour. Here he is, 111 pitches, and he's showing you his off-speed pitches. Now, a lot of guys are going to go to their bread and butter when they get tired, just rear back and fire it. Tony Losi is pitching. He's not throwing. He's pitching the ball. Good job to get a bat on it, and a better job on the catch by King and Wright. Riley King, and yeah, tip of the cap by Tony Losi. Kings had a hot bat, and he makes the play of the game defensively for Georgia and right. A beautiful snag in right field by Riley King. And, and yes, the, the, the catch was great. What I like is the fact that he knew exactly where he was. He knew he had enough room, even though he was on the warning track, that he could dive for that ball and he wasn't going to collide into the wall. The awareness that he had allowed him to make that catch and possibly save a rally. And that wasn't one of those... I know sometimes you outfielders, David, you like to milk it a little bit. Unnecessary <laughs> jump or dive, try to get on Sports Center. That that was legit. He had to... That was legit. I'll give it to him. I Yeah, I know a lot of guys that milked it. <laughs> you, you know the funny thing is when you got on when, when Sports Center started doing the top ten and you started having the SBs, you saw a lot more milking it right? out there than before. Oh yeah. Ball is cranked down the right field line, a towering fly, but right into Kudzu corner. Here we are, Tony Losey. The way he's pitching has allowed him to now possibly get his his last inning in to make it through the complete inning without maybe just going out there for one batter. He's doing it because he's attacking the strike zone right there. And he's still burning the corners that time at 94 miles an hour. Ethan Paul saying, come on, man. What do you want me to do with that? Ethan Paul, the senior from Bellevue, Washington, former freshman All-American. A lot of productivity in this guy's career. Sprays one to left. Jernigan is there. He'll handle it for out number three. Stretch time in Athens. What a defensive play in right field by Riley King. If you have your pitcher giving maximum effort on the mound, you want to do the same if you're a defender, and that's exactly how you do it. Show him you care and bring your offense back to the dugout. Hugs and high fives for Tony Losey while we were away in the Georgia dugout. You'd have to think his day is done at 117 pitches and a fresh Georgia bullpen. Seven innings pitched, just one run allowed, just one hit against one of the most lethal offenses in the SEC in Vanderbilt. Little insurance never hurts. Jernigan Maxwell and Shepard as Jernigan rolls one to Paul at shortstop for the first out. Tonight at 6 Eastern time here on the SEC Network, we'll have the second game of a big three-game softball series between number 14 Auburn and seventh-ranked Tennessee. SEC softball also available on the ESPN app. Alongside the former Ole Miss All-American, David DeLucci. Mike Morgan with you at Foley Field on what has turned out to be a picturesque sunny Sunday 
afternoon at Foley Field, rubber game of the series. And temperature just below 70, a slight breeze. I mean, on your typical day this time of year in Athens, we might have sweated out a few pounds by now, <laughs> but not today. This has been perfect. A lot of inclement weather throughout the southeast affecting other series, but not this one. Two and one now the count on the nine-hole hitter, junior Tucker Maxwell, who has produced his best season offensively. Six home runs, the batting average just below 300. For a while there, Tucker Maxwell struggled at the plate. 177 as a freshman, 216 as a sophomore. But he has figured it out. The junior from Dawsonville, Georgia has. And he gets a one-out walk. So Hugh Fisher is human. Back to the top of the order in Cam Shepard. Shepard out of Duluth had the great freshman year. His father, Mike, played for Georgia Southern and was drafted by the Cincinnati Reds. Shepard right away, plus defender at shortstop. They're waiting for the bat to come back around. He showed glimpses as a freshman and then struggled at the plate last year. Some injuries had to do with that, but here he is. Low 200s, and this is junior year. They, they keep him in the leadoff spot, and one of the reasons they do that, he's second in the SEC in walks with 27. So while the average is low, the on-base percentage is more than respectable. And really, at the leadoff guy, that's, that's the most important thing is you need a, sa a table setter. Dribbles one to second. Only play for Ray will be to Infante at first for the second out. Shepard now one for 15 in this series. Riley King had the hit of the game yesterday. He came in three for seven in the series. He's 0 for 1 with two walks today. And when he does hit a home run, he makes the most of it. Two grand slams now on the season for Riley King. Sophomore from Lawrenceville, Georgia. Jumps on the first one and taps it back to Fisher. High throw, but hauled in nonetheless by Infante. So Fisher works around the walk. We're through seven, three, one Bulldogs. What an entertaining game to watch here thus far. Three to one, Georgia leading the rubber game of the series. That man, Tony Losey. 117 pitches, but some big ones thrown in the sixth inning. This game really could have turned either way in the bottom of the sixth. Georgia getting a run. It was a miscue right here, and this has kind of been something that Vanderbilt has battled all year. Georgia capitalizes off the error by Ray, scores an RBI hit with Tally. And then this guy comes in. Filthy. Hugh Fisher just carving Georgia batters up. Cable. Marshall, Cheney Rogers, very uncomfortable bats. But he is the reason this game is still tight. Georgia has the lead by two. Zach Christofak has become a household name for the Georgia Bulldogs bullpen, a junior. You see the numbers. That 506 is really misleading. He was kind of hurting a little bit in terms of performance. He had some back-to-back -back games where he got roughed up but he's had consecutive clean outings. He's not allowed a hit in his last couple of outings out of the bullpen. He's got a nasty curveball, and when he's on, can be a dominating reliever. Former draft pick of the Atlanta Braves back in 2016 before deciding to pitch in college. And last year, he ranked among the SEC leaders in appearances with 31. Ten wins, seven saves in the career of Zach Christofak. Christofak has a very similar makeup to all of the other Georgia pitchers that you see, especially 
Shunt coming out of the bullpen. The, these guys are, are going to attack the strike zone. They're going to come right at you. At times, because of that mindset, because they're going to throw strikes, they're going to give up some home runs. And we saw Shunt did that game one of this series. More often than not, the way stats work in baseball, they're going to get out. But what they will do is they're going to keep that defense behind them awake because there's more likely a chance to put the ball in play. Right. Full count to Ty Duvall. Walker Grisante has grabbed a bat and is on deck right now for Vanderbilt, so he might hit for Infante. He's been clutch. He's a big part of that comeback on Friday night for the Commodores. Swing and a miss, strike three. 94 miles an hour, and right on by the bat of Ty Duvall. Gasoline just Christofak rearing back. 94 miles an hour, not your typical velocity coming from a guy with that frame. You always think about into the row, into the bullpen pitchers being 6'5", 6'6". I'd love to see guys like Christofak get in there, bear down, and show, hey, man, you don't have to be a giant to go up there and, and get batters out at the end of the game. Grisante is senior who could start for a lot of teams. Got those Popeye arms. Look like he could get on the gridiron for Coach Mason and Vanderbilt. This is a guy you love having off the bench, though. I mean, he's not your typical pinch hitter, late inning guy. And has come up with a number of big moments this year, including on Friday night. Probably the most difficult role in baseball is to be the pinch hitter. And you come in late in the game, eighth, ninth inning, game's on the line. That's what he did on Friday. Game tying home run on Friday night. Gives this one a ride, but got under it. And the catch is made by King for the second out of the inning. So if we go back to the top of the order for the fourth time through, it's Cooper Davis. Davis 0 for 2 with a walk. Georgia winning a lot of games on pitching and defense this year, and that trend has continued so far today. An errorless game for Georgia in the field. Just one hit for Vanderbilt. Losey could not ask for a better performance out of the junior, and now Christofak leading the way out of the bullpen. To second, gobbled up by Tally. How about Christofak with a 1 2 3 inning? Georgia coming to bat up by two. Time now for our All-State Good Hands play of the game. How about the catch in right? I love it. Riley King, tip of the cap by Tony Losey. That was in a huge spot in this game. Georgia has been terrific in the field throughout today. Helping Tony Losey behind one of his best starts of the year. Losey would stand to win this game and improve to 5-0 on the season. And I would add that Kumar Rocker for Vanderbilt, he's not going to win this game, but he pitched very well for the Commodores, got hurt by an error on the second baseman, Ray in a key spot. But not your typical Sunday pitcher's duel. You know, it used to be a pack of lunch day when you had a Sunday game in the SEC and expected a lot of runs, a lot of offense. Both pitchers, both pitching staffs stingy today, just four total runs, just six total hits. Part of the order was Shunk starting things off here in the home half of the eighth. And if you, you, you look at what Georgia's pitching staff, and we still have some game left here, but Vanderbilt coming in, scored 10-plus runs a game 12 times this year, averaged a little over eight runs a game. 
this offense is is big time. They can they can put some crooked numbers up on the scoreboard, and they come into a series, and this is a series that could possibly be the deciding factor for the Eastern Division champion down the, the road. Georgia has shut Vanderbilt down. I'm glad you mentioned that the magnitude again of this series. I know we talked about it early, but it's worth repeating. This is a Georgia program. Last year they made their first regional since 2011. Now they had hit the skids for a number of years. They weren't just missing regionals. They were finishing either at the bottom or near the bottom of the Eastern Division. It's a program that not long ago won a national championship in 1990. That 1990 team, by the way, featured one Dave Fleming. Went on to a major league career, left-handed pitcher. A shot up the box and into center field. Lead-off single for Aaron Shunk. The, the star of that 1990 national championship team was a guy by the name of Mike Reben, who passed away earlier this year of cancer. Very sad news. They're going to honor him later this year. But two complete games he pitched, and he beat Mike Mussina twice in Omaha to bring home the crown. And a lot of people forget this. That was the first World Series championship for anybody in the SEC. Now, LSU would eventually rewrite the record books. And since then, we've seen Florida, South Carolina win a pair, Vanderbilt in 2014. A lot of programs have gotten in on the fun, but Georgia won it. They go back to Omaha in 2001 with one Ron Polk. Then Dave Perno goes to Omaha three times. They have two tragic incidents where a, a young man gets paralyzed. And I think that set the program back in a number of different ways psychologically. They hire Scott Strickland. He's a hot name at the time. He takes Kent State to the College World Series. Four straight years, four losing records. Now, there's a lot of programs where the fans here become do or die, much like in football and basketball, where they say, okay, we've got to make a change. Georgia stayed with him. And now I think, Dave, as Tally hits one high and deep right center, doesn't have enough, though. Blade will make the catch. I think Georgia is here to stay. I, I think this has been a sleeping giant program. There's so much talent in East Cobb alone. Okay, see what he did the first four years. I mean, that's going to get you fired in a lot of places. And Scott Strickland very open with us about the fact that his administration told him we will be patient. We understand this is not a three-year rebuild. This is going to take longer. He didn't get a bunch of JUCOs. He knew he was going to take his lumps. They did. But a national seed last year, fighting for an SEC championship this year and a lot of great young players who will be back next season including Emerson Hancock that's a diving catch in center by Davis I'm talking about Hancock Hancock could be the number one overall pick in the draft yep. next season and he is going to be back for his junior year of course we'll see how Tony Losey does with the draft but you got some other good young arms like Orion Webb Georgia's not going anywhere. I think the time to pick on the Bulldogs is over, yes. and you're going to see this program have staying power. Yes, I totally agree. And and mentioned it earlier, but it, it was the end of 2017. They won series against Kentucky, who was number four at the time, Mississippi State, who I believe was number six at the time, and South Carolina, who was number 30 at the time. And they did it with a predominantly freshman-heavy lineup. And so those guys matured, and then you had you had to take note and say, I wonder what they're going to be like this year. They ended the year with confidence, and it carried over. And and last year, you know, it was a team that the doubters said, well, they can't do this, can't do that. They were a national seed. Those young men kept maturing, kept playing with confidence, and they had three three big bangers in that lineup, guys that accounted for 43 of the 64 home runs, I think. Naysayers once again say, well, what are they going to do without those guys? Well, they're still winning. They find ways to win. They may not impress you with the stats, but it's not all about stats. The only stat that really matters is the win-loss record. These guys are doing it with pitching. They're doing it with exceptional defense. Coming into this game, they were leading the SEC with a 988 fielding percentage. They're not going to beat themselves. 
they find ways to win. And you're right. They didn't bring in a bunch of JUCO guys because when you bring in JUCO guys, you got a winning team for two years, Mm -hmm. and those guys move on. They started with a freshman foundation. Those guys had patience. They had a plan with Coach Strickland, and it's paying off. Football team is having success. And I remember talking to Coach Bohannon about this, asking him at Alabama, how do you feel about being at a football-heavy college? He said, I love it. I love bringing recruits in Mm -hmm. to a football game. Guess what Georgia has? Fantastic football program. Hugh Fisher has some fantastic stuff with a backward K there. As he freezes Shane Marshall for the third out of the inning. We'll keep it here with Georgia on top by a score of 3-1. to one. You're right, college football only helps the other programs like baseball in this conference because I don't know many college baseball players that are not a fan of college football, right. so that's certainly a feather in the cap for this program as well. And now the question becomes, does Christofak come back out for the night? It looks like he will after a 1-2-3 eighth inning. Now Georgia three outs away from getting a little cushion atop the SEC. They would improve to nine and three. Vanderbilt, of course, would fall to seven and five in conference play. So Georgia having a chance to make another resounding statement by taking a series against the Vanderbilt Commodores. Vanderbilt, no doubt, will not go down easily in a good spot in the order for the Commodores with Martin, Bladé, and Scott. Another great part of this program. I remember in those early 2000s, this was a packed house. Foley Field was intimidating, and then it it got real quiet here, to be honest with you. It's getting to be a great environment again. Sellout crowds for both Friday, Saturday, and today, Sunday. Sunday noon start, always a tough sell for a lot of folks, people going to church, what have you. But great crowds here throughout this three-game series at Foley Field in Athens. They're excited about where this baseball program is again. Over 3,000 fans here for all three games at Foley Field. You see the summary today. Both Rocker and Losey showed up, brought some good stuff to the table. Vanderbilt unable to cash in 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position. And the meaty part of the order for the Bulldogs coming through. Four hits, a double, a run batted in, and two runs scored. But don't put it in the win column just yet. It's a Vanderbilt team that knows a thing or two about comebacks and a great spot in the order to produce just that. Martin, Bladé, and Scott. Austin Martin, a strikeout, an RBI ground out, and he flied out his last time up. In this situation right here, you're Krista Fack. You have got to go directly to the strike zone for Austin Martin. You cannot put him on base by walk because when you do that, the lead is only by two. And with J.J. Bladé hovering behind Austin Martin, gives you the opportunity with one swing of the bat to tie the game up. You'd rather take your chances of throwing strikes and having Austin Martin put the ball in play than to give him a free bag. This would scare me. Martin's a 400 hitter this year, one of the tops in the league. He's 0 for 12 in this series. (laughs) You're saying he's due? (laughs) I'm saying he's due. I'm saying he doesn't put up a whole lot of 0 for 13s. And he's down in the count. Two-strike pitch, and now it's full to the sophomore out of Jacksonville. Payoff, got him. Paint job on the outside corner. Well, oftentimes we say the pitcher has to go at the hitter. He's got to throw strikes, but but that doesn't mean it has to be over the heart of the plate. This right here is a slider that breaks. It starts over the outside part of the plate. It breaks directly off of the corner. Austin Martin doesn't think so, but Georgia has one out in the ninth. Vanderbilt has not scored a hit in this game since the double by Duvall in the fifth inning. J.J. Bladé. (laughs) 
hammers one. Diving stop. Rogers smothered it. Races to the bag and makes the play. Well, you talk about the defense better be on their toes when you have a pitcher that's going to command the strike zone. And right there, that could possibly be a game-saving play. For sure, if this ball gets past Rodgers, that is a double, maybe triple, and the young man extension all the way out with the hop. Now, that ball hopped over his head, but to be able to get that in his glove, pop up, and beat the speedy Blade, incredible play. That, my friends, is a Sports Center Top 10 nominee. We also have something else at stake. Georgia has not won a series against Vanderbilt since 2008. That was in Nashville 11 years ago. And they are one strike away from pulling off the feet here. Christofak is dealing. The shift is on. For Scott and an 0-2 pitch. There you see the shift employed by the Georgia defense. Dribbler into the shift, scooped up and the throw. Georgia does it. First series victory over the Commodores in 11 years. Great pitching, great defense, and a 3-1 to one victory over one of the top teams in America, the Vanderbilt Commodores. Well, that's not what you want to see after a big win is, is the guy that closed the game, game go down. But listen, the fact of the matter is two top programs in the Eastern Division of the SEC, Georgia quite possibly with the series win could have set them up for an Eastern Championship at the end of the year. Georgia is for real. They're doing this with pitching and defense. We saw outstanding plays this past inning and timely hitting. So all the naysayers better take mark. Georgia Bulldogs are here to stay. Vanderbilt, they're not going anywhere either. I predict that their offense is going to catch fire on the next pitching staff that they see. It was a tremendous weekend. Yeah, the story is, is not about what Vanderbilt did wrong this weekend. It really is more about what Georgia did right. Vanderbilt played a quality series, but, but Georgia on the mound and defensively. Again, they're not the most lethal lineup. They score just enough. This is a pitching and defense team, and that's what won out here today. More great defense this time by Rodgers at first. What a fitting way to help shut down the Commodores in the ninth. More to come when we return from Athens.